Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see so many of you here in Lionsdown Hall. Uh, a warm welcome to everyone on the live stream as well. Um, and let me add my greeting to Ray's. Well, the wonderful thing when we come to God's Word, as we're doing now, is that it's not about us bringing life to the passage ahead of us, but God's Word brings life to us. Um, so let me pray for God's help as we do that now. Father, we praise you that your word is indeed life, that is living and active, cutting to our hearts and revealing our sin, and yet making them whole again with your gospel. And Father, we pray that that would be happening right now um, as we study your word. Amen. Well, where does your help come from? When things go wrong, where do you turn? When things go well, who gets the credit? That's the question that our psalmist asks today. Did you see that in verse 1? It says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? And our psalmist today is going to show us, first of all, where we shouldn't put, find our help, where our help doesn't come from, but also why our help comes from the Lord and why that's such a wonderful thing. Now, our psalm is a psalm of ascents, which was probably sung by the pilgrims in uh, Israel as they all journeyed up to Jerusalem for one of the three religious festivals um, of the year. And as they journeyed, they would have sung these psalms to each other. And you can imagine uh, uh, there is a, a Jew who is travelling, maybe from, from north Israel, and as he comes, he sees, and he looks up, and he sees over there these mighty hills. He knows he's getting near Jerusalem. And as he lifts his eyes to the hills, he thinks, does my help come from them? You see, they would be tall, strong, imposing hills, and there'd be a natural fortress from enemies attacking from the east. They probably uh, had things like figs and olives and grapes growing on the side, protection and provision, um, of course, that would be where his help comes from. But actually, he doesn't stop there. His eyes, as he looked to the hills, he looks upwards to the Lord, the creator of the hills, the creator of the heaven and earth. And that's the first point our psalmist makes today. It's to lift our eyes from creation to the creator. You see, although the hills would have been a great help for the people of Israel... It was God who gave them the hills. It was God who brought them into the land. And, and it was God who made them a natural fortress and a place um, where they could grow crops. You see, God will use things in the world to help us, but he is the one who has created them and gives them to his people. Our help doesn't come from the things around us, perhaps from the wisdom of, of people, or perhaps from money or time or resources or even just looking up things on the internet. Our help comes from the Lord who made those things and gives them to his people. Yet often I think we forget that. Often we, we just look to the things around us, don't we, in creation, and we stop there. You know, when things are going wrong, maybe we turn to a friend and ask them for their help straight away, and we never, th uh, never think to pray to the Lord and ask for his help. Or when things go well and and maybe we're enjoying life. You know, we might be quick to tell someone how great a holiday we've had, but we forget to thank the Lord for that time he's given. It's a bit like if, say, you, imagine you were going on a long trip, and you were going to drive there, but your car was broken. It failed at 17, it was in the garage. And then someone very kindly offers to lend you theirs. So, sure enough, you drive away, you do whatever you're going to do, and when you get back, you spend all your time telling your friends how great that car was. It had a really nice stereo, and it was really fuel efficient. But you don't actually say anything to your friend who lent it to you. You don't say thank you. And you don't say how kind they were. That's a bit like what we do when we focus all our time on the things around us in creation and forget to pray to the Lord and ask for his help. Forget to thank him for what he gives us. Well, we've just been through, uh, and we're coming out of a big pandemic, aren't we? And in this time, we've needed a lot of help. Um, and wonderfully, I think we've had, a, we've, seen a, we've had a great healthcare service where people have been able to be treated and, and wonderfully 
um, there have been doctors and nurses who've been working hard to help people. Um, and perhaps we could say from the psalm, I lift, my help up, I lift my eyes to the NHS. Where does my help come from? Well, my help comes from the Lord who made the doctors and the nurses and all those in the NHS. It's the same idea. We thank God for the things he's given us, but we lift our eyes to the creator who gave them. It doesn't mean ignoring the things around us, the ways that God helps us, but it does mean remembering where our ultimate help is. So perhaps you've just got some good results from your A-levels, or you've had a good appraisal at work. Well, where is your help? Is it in your intelligence, your ability to pass an an exam? Or is it in God who gave you that ability and that knowledge and that opportunity? Perhaps you've got a hard relationship or a, a friendship at the moment which is going wrong. Well, where is your ability to fix it? Is that in your own ability to restore the relationship? Well, no, surely it's got to be in the Lord who restores his people to himself on the cross and restores relationships. Maybe you can do it in Christian senses. You've just given a really good Bible study or you've shared the gospel with a friend for the first time. Well, where's your help? Is it in your ability to speak clearly and to understand the Bible? Well, no. Your help is in the God who opens our eyes to the Bible, who opens our mouth to speak the truths. We are to lift our eyes from the creation to the creator. Now, in verse 3, a new voice enters. Um, Verse 1 and and 2 were I. And in verse 3, we see it talks about you. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. It's like the psalmist's friends are are telling him a truth, another reason why our help comes from the Lord and not from the things around us. You see, the word keep in in verse 3 and 4 means to guard, to protect. It means to oversee, to watch. It's the idea of, of maybe a night watchman or even a bodyguard. Now, if you think of a bodyguard, imagine walking around New Barnet with a bodyguard. You know, you've got someone who every time a car might, you know, doesn't, might not stop as you go over pedestrian crossing, runs out in front of the car and will take it instead of you. Um, maybe someone who's always looking around for someone to, who's going to pocket, uh, take your wallet, pickpocket your wallet. Someone who's always protecting you. And actually, even when you go to bed at night, they're there guarding the front door and the windows, making sure nobody breaks in in the night when you're asleep. Well, this is the God of Israel, the God who protects his people. He's always on duty. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. He's always protecting and guarding his people. Now, the Israelites would have thought of this, and it really brought some imagery from the Old Testament to them as they they went up for these festivals, and they sung these truths about God guarding them. You see, as they went up for the Passover, they would have remembered um, how God when they were in Egypt, how God guarded and hovered over the houses that had the blood of the lamb painted on the door, on the door and how that meant that the angel of death did not come and destroy the firstborn like he did to the Egyptians, but he guarded them and protected them and kept them safe and brought them out, freed them. As they went up for the harvest festival, they would have remembered how God had guarded and kept them that year how he had provided crops and produce for them so they could keep on living. As they went up for the Feast of Booths, where they would all live in these sort of temporary shelters, they would have thought back to the book of Numbers, when for 40 years they wandered in the wilderness as fugitive slaves, and yet God provided water and manna for them. He protected them from his enemies and ultimately brought them into the promised land They would have remembered that all through the Old Testament, God guarded his people. And actually, 2,000 years on from the writing of the New Testament, we can see that's true, not just in the New Testament as well, but right through church history to today. There's not been a moment when God has ever stopped guarding his people. Now in verse 5 and 6, we get another image. 
The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. Well, it's the image of somebody as they trudge through the hot Palestinian sun, making their way up on this long journey of someone holding a shade by them to protect them from the sun beating down on them. And not just from the sun beating down on them by day, but also from the bitter cold temperatures in the night. Whatever the weather, God was protecting his people. He was guarding them. He was watching over them. Nothing in creation um, could attack them. Now, I think that's in a, in a physical sense that was true, but also the sun and the moon would have been gods that were worshipped by the nations around them. In fact, actually, in the Middle East, the sun god was often one of the most important gods and probably would have been the god that the, the other nations would have looked to. And what it's saying here is that even those gods are under God's control. Why? Well, because they're just created things. They're the sun and the moon. God made them in Genesis chapter 1. Of course they're under his control. Of course they have no power over the Israelites and they have no power over God's people. Now, in our society, not many people worship the sun and moon, but I think we still have the, these idea of, sort of gods and these highest values that people live for. Perhaps it's the idea of being free from traditional institutions to be ourselves. Well, that puts pressure on Christians to give up on the Bible. And yet God will protect his people. He will keep us faithful to his word. Perhaps it's the idea of living for pleasure and experience. Have you done this? Have you done that? Whether it's sort of trekking in the Andes Mountains in South America or just binge-watching on Netflix at home. Well, Christians are called to give up their cross and follow him. And God guards and protects his people as they do that. Or maybe it's just just the, the motive of live for yourself. Live for number one. Live for your own kingdom and your own glory. Well, as Christians renounce that, as Christians live for the creator and the saviour, God guards and protects his people. And in seven to, verses 7 to 8, it comes to a real climax. Did you see that? The Lord will keep you from all evil. The Lord will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. There is no evil that can befall a Christian without God's good permission. There is nothing that can take away a Christian's life except according to God's good plan. There is no activity, neither coming, nor going, nor staying, nor whatever it might be, that is outside of the scope of God's control. And there is no time from now and to tomorrow and a thousand years into eternity, that God will not protect his people. Do you get the message? God will guard his people. Paul brings up this in the um, the eighth chapter of Romans, perhaps a very precious chapter to many of us. He says this, For I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you hear that? Nor anything else in all creation. Whatever you can name, that can't separate God's people from his protection and his love. And I think the key is that last line, to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That shows us how God guards his people. It's talking about the Lord Jesus who came into this world, who came closer than the shade on our right hand, lived among us and suffered on our behalf. It's talking about the Lord Jesus who, though he came into the world, God did not keep from evil, God did not keep his life, but gave him up for his people. It's talking about the Lord Jesus, who was lifted up on the cross and exposed to all creation, and the sun went dark as God poured his wrath out on his son for three hours. 
The Lord Jesus suffered and bled and died to guard and protect his people, to protect them from the most dangerous thing in all creation, which is God's holy wrath on sin. And that tells us that as Christians, if we are to find out and remember that our help comes from the Lord, we need to keep coming to the cross because that is where we see it most clearly. As we come to the Bible, we see in the gospel the Lord Jesus given up for his people so that his people could be made right with God and enjoy God's good protection. So today, if you're coming and you're just exploring um, things of the Bible and Christian things, can I really urge you that the only safe help is the Lord Jesus? All other help will crumble and disappear and fade away. Only the Lord Jesus will stand firm. And if you're a Christian, then the same is true. We don't stop coming to the cross when we become a Christian. In fact, we keep coming to the cross every day, remembering that the Lord Jesus bled and died for his people, that he is our help. Our help comes from him and not from anything else. That's why our personal Bible reading, our quiet times, are so important, right? That's why it's so important that we meet together. That's why our prayer time is essential as we trust in our help, the Lord, the Creator and the Saviour. So we've seen that we are to lift our eyes from the creation to the Creator, but we are also to trust in the Lord, our Saviour. But there's, there's one more way that our psalm helps us to remember where our help comes from. And I wondered if you saw the, the change in voice in ver- between verses 1 and 2 and verses 3 and 4. It goes from I and my to you and your. It's a call and response. It would be a bit like if Anna were to sing the first line of one of the songs and then the rest of us were to sing it back. And in fact, we know that this was a song because the title is A Song of Ascents. You see, this psalm was written so that God's people could tell each other these truths. Perhaps the leader of, of, one, of one group of people from a village would, would say or sing the first line and the whole community who are walking with him would sing it back. In fact, that's really what the psalms are. The psalms are a poetry, they're songs that... God's people recite to each other and sing with each other to tell each other the gospel truths that are contained in them. So we are here to keep telling each other these truths. We are here so that we can tell each other where our help comes from. We're to challenge each other. Are we putting our hope in creation? Let's challenge each other. Are we struggling to find help? Well, let's remind each other who our help is, that our help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Can I give you a challenge? After the service, when we talk about our week or the football yesterday or what was on TV, why don't we ask each other where our help comes from? That's what this psalm is telling us to do, right? To encourage each other, to challenge each other with these truths. I really hope someone comes and tells me that because I need to remember these truths as well. And perhaps if you're watching on the live stream, why don't you pick up your phone? Why don't you text a Christian or call a Christian who's struggling? Ask them how they are. Remind them how good it is to put our our hope and why it's so good that our help is in the Lord Jesus. You see, God has given us each other to help us remember um, these truths. Uh, We're not to go it alone. We're to come here as lines down church family to build each other up and encourage each other with these truths to remind each other of where our help comes from, not from creation, but from the Creator and from our Saviour. Now, the great thing is we've got a chance to do that in our final song as we remember these truths together. Um, So let me pray that we would do that as as we do have our, our final song. Heavenly Father, we thank you that our help comes from you alone. We thank you that you are our creator who made all things. And we thank you that you are our saviour who guards your people, who gave up the Lord Jesus for us. Father, we're so sorry for when we turn and put our hope and, and find our help in the wrong things. 
And Father, we pray for your mercy and we ask that we would keep coming to you our help this week and keep encouraging one another to find our help in you. Pray this in Jesus' name for your glory. Amen.